Good morning. Welcome to the Orchard Oxford online service. We are so grateful that you're tuning in this morning and happy Mother's Day uh, to all the mothers out there. We are so grateful for you. We recognize that this is a joyous day, a joy to celebrate uh, for our moms and with our moms. Um, but we also recognize that this day can hold some weight for others, can hold some grief for others. And so wherever you are this morning, whether you're in celebration or whether you're in sorrow, uh, we rest in the fact that we can bring all of those emotions to our Father who knows us, who loves us, who cares for us, uh, who wants to be with us in that. So wherever you are this morning, both physically and emotionally, we are excited that you're tuning in this morning. Let's pray as we begin in this time together. Father, we come before you uh, on a Sunday morning with expectation, with expectation in our hearts, Lord, of the things that you'd have for us to learn. God, as we turn to your scriptures, we turn to them with expectation, with joy, with excitement, to ask, Lord, that you would do something amazing through this time that we have together. God, as we read the very words, the very words that are active and alive and sharper than any double-edged sword, God, may they cut deep into our hearts. God, to shape us to look more like your Son. Father, we're grateful for technology and the gift that is the ability to worship with one another, to learn together about how we can grow to look more like Jesus. So God, I ask that in this time that you would be glorified, that you would be praised, and that your name would be lifted high. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. The world was his art studio. He was a young little boy from a small town in the Delta in Mississippi. And he was inspired by his grandmother. She was an artist. She loved to paint. She was a quilter. And one day his mother, Betty, has got all these boxes just everywhere. She's ready to go to the Salvation Army and drop a bunch of stuff off. And on one of the top of these boxes is this old green shabby coat. Now, many of you mothers can relate to this, or if you're a child, you can think about maybe the ways that you pestered your own mother or your father. He is persistent. He wants this green coat. And at some point, like all parents, they just kind of give up, and she gives her small son this green shabby coat. When he gets home, he books it down to the the basement, and he grabs multiple different things, including two small ping pong balls. And from there, he would eventually form this. We'll show you a picture. It's Kermit the Frog. This is a story of Leland, Mississippi's own Jim Henson. We've come to know he created Kermit the Frog and multiple other Muppets and characters from Sesame Street. An incredible story of some small kid who saw something that seamlessly looked like nothing and created something beautiful out of it. Years ago, I heard somebody ask this question when they were reflecting on the life of Jim Henson. We'll throw this question up on the screen. If a little boy with a vivid imagination, can create such lovable characters out of old clothing? What could the God of the universe do if we submitted our entire lives to Him? What could the God of the universe do if we submitted our entire lives to Him? Have you ever pondered that question before? Maybe for some of you, you've never pondered that question at all, and our hope today is that you would have an encounter with Jesus And if you would give your life to him, watch out something out of nothing, beautiful, God can create something incredible. And maybe for some of us who have been following Jesus for quite some time, friends, maybe you've pondered that question before, but it's been a while. And we want to create adequate space today just to stop, to pause, to really consider that question. And what would it look like for you to take one step closer to Jesus and give more and more of your life to him? Friends, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard Oxford. As always, we're grateful you've carved out space to hang out with us. You matter. You matter to God. You matter to us. Thank you so much. We're excited as we continue on in week three of a teaching series called This is the Life. We've been journeying through the book of Proverbs. So today, we're going to put the reference up on the screen. We're going to be in Proverbs 8, verses 1 through 36. So if you've got a Bible, mobile device, why don't you turn there right now? And I'm going to read just a few verses. Four verses is all I'm going to read. Uh, Have your Bible, your mobile device in front of you. We're going to unpack multiple sections of this whole passage. We're excited for this time together. I'm going to read these few verses. I'm going to pray for us. And we're just going to jump right into it. The title of this passage is Wisdom Calls for a Hearing. Listen, as wisdom calls out, 
Here, as understanding raises her voice. On the hilltop along the road, she takes her stand at the crossroads. By the gates at the entrance to the town, on the road leading in, she cries aloud, I call to you, to all of you. I raise my voice to all people. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time and space and always, first and foremost, the gift of your son, Jesus, and his word. And as we just read, your voice, God, cries out to all people that you have something that you want to say and speak to every one of us. So may we hear your words. It's not about mine. May we hear your voice and your words and your path, your direction for our lives. And God, in a spirit of vulnerability today, it would take a lot for us to continue to submit all of our lives to you, but we pray that it might happen today. We believe in faith that it can and it will, and you will do something incredible with whatever we offer you. In your name we pray. Amen. So in these few verses that we just read, maybe you kind of caught this unique connection here in verse 1. And the words stick out here. It says that here is understanding raises her voice. So just a little context here. Maybe we've got some questions. Is this idea of wisdom calling out, is wisdom feminine? Now I have to stop and pause because we all can just admit on this Mother's Day that ladies always know what's best. In the mighty words of the cultural prophet Beyonce, who runs the world? Girls. All right. At this point, we could have every lady who's watching today, or if you're in the room with a mother or another female, you just say amen, and we pray and we call it a day. But how are we to understand what's happening here? This kind of impression that we have that wisdom is this kind of feminine tone or feminine voice. Well, Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs, is using a poetic technique known as personification. Poets use it today. They've been using it for quite some time. We find it all throughout the scriptures as well. What personification does is it takes a thing or an idea like wisdom and it associates it and give it, it gives it an image as if it was human. So in Proverbs 8, we've got this character known as Lady Wisdom. And in Proverbs 7, we're going to get to this. In the previous chapter, we have Lady Folly. There's a contrast here. But the way that we're supposed to understand this in Proverbs 8 is that Lady Wisdom is just a personification of Solomon's wisdom. The words that we're reading all throughout this book, God gave to Solomon, one of the wisest men in all of the world, with the exception of Jesus, who shares us inside upon inside about God's love, about how human relationships work, multiple different topics. So Lady Wisdom is a personification of Solomon's wisdom. But we can go a step further. Solomon's wisdom is ultimately a personification of God's wisdom. We learned last week from Alex Crosby, our discipleship pastor, that if we want to seek wisdom in our life, God's type of wisdom, the wisdom we all earnestly know that we need, well, then we seek Jesus. We learned from 1 Corinthians 1 that Jesus himself is the wisdom of God. So if we want wisdom in our lives, we need to seek Jesus, God's son. Now, again, two different types of wisdom here. I mean, uh, two different types of paths. Lady wisdom in chapter 8, lady folly in chapter 7. Now, why do we have to examine this contrast here? Well, friends, I don't know about you, that I live in this kind of tug of war match all the time. I'm challenged. I feel temptation. As much as I know that God desires for me to go towards him, At the end of the day, we live in kind of these crossroad moments where we're kind of torn between two separate paths, this tug of war match back and forth. There are times in the worst of my decisions, even this week, I make small bogus decisions where like Proverbs 7, 7, I am living, I am lacking common sense on doing what is the wise and the right thing to do. And we say this at the orchard all the time, sin, which is that foolish path, it always overpromises and it underdelivers. And we feel that tension. I'm going to throw several descriptors on the screen. When we choose this path of foolish living or folly, this is what we see in our lives. We've chosen sexual immorality, deception, pride, arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech, saying things that we wish we never would have said. All of those we get from chapter 8, you can see the references on the screen. That's that tug-of-war match in our worst moments. We go towards paths that we think are going to give us life, but they really don't. 
And if we go down the path of folly or following Lady Folly as this is personified, what's the outcome of that? Well, grab your Bibles. Let's look here, particularly here in verse 36, the last verse of this chapter. But those who miss me injure themselves. All who hate me love death. Sin over promises, it under delivers. And the thing that it delivers time and time again is we feel this injury upon our lives. We feel death. It's not life that's truly life. When you look at your life right now, maybe it's small decisions, big decisions that you've made that have gone down foolish paths. Is it hard for us to recognize in those moments that we've injured ourselves physically, emotionally, relationally, like we are choosing paths that don't get us to the outcome that we would truly desire for our lives? So I have to seek Jesus and his wisdom because I'm in this tug of war, I'm in this temptation and the struggle, and I want to at times go towards the path of Lady Folly. But chapter 8 reminds us that we don't have to go down that path of Lady Folly. We can choose to follow Lady Wisdom, God's wisdom. You know, in chapter 8, again, we look at a ton of these different descriptors that when we choose to go down this path of listening to God's voice, the outcome can be incredible. Again, we'll put some references on the screen. This is just from chapter 8 alone. This path of wisdom is wholesome. It's plain and clear. It's valuable more than silver, gold, or rubies. It's a path of good judgment, knowledge, and discernment. We all need that right now. It gives common sense, success, insight, and strength. And just like folly has an outcome... In the same regards, going down the path of lady wisdom has an outcome as well. Grab your Bibles. Let's look at verse 32, 832 and following. I love these descriptors that when we choose that path of following lady wisdom, God's wisdom, this is what we get. And so, my children, listen to me. All who follow my ways are what? Joyful. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Joyful again are those who listen to me, watching for me daily at my gates, waiting for me outside my home. Whoever finds me, finds life and receives favor from the Lord. The outcome is clear. We get joy. We get the life. Hence the name of this teaching series, This is the Life. We get this path that when we get to the end of it, when we make the wise call, we heed to God's instructions and we follow his wisdom and we put those things in obedience, we can say on the back end with a spirit of joy, God knows what he's talking about. We trust his voice. We follow his lead. You see, all of Proverbs 8 is about an invitation. In the few verses that we read, it's about a crossroad moment. Again, I'll read this. This is what God says. On the hilltop along the road, she takes her stand at the crossroads. By the gates at the entrance of the town, on the road leading in, she cries aloud, I call to all of you, to all of you. I love that picture. It's like in the noise of life and the tension between Lady Folly and Lady Wisdom and my foolish temptations and the desire to do the right thing. God is standing at the highest point in the city. And he's crying out at the entrance of its gates. And he's saying in the crossroads of your heart, listen to me, come to me, follow me in this moment. Friends, crossroad moments are paramount. They are world changing. We may think at times they're not, but both the small and big crossroad moments of our lives, these are decisions that will transcend decades that will change our world, will relationally change the world of those around us, that will allow us to, in the moment, experience joy and order and peace and life that's truly life. Or if we choose to go at that crossroads, as God is crying out of the distance, we choose to go towards Lady Folly, we can expect injury and disorder and a death happening within us. I wonder if we would stop and pause and reflect that in the small and the big decisions both, that we would recognize what's at stake, that we should choose to go towards the path of wisdom. And if we don't, if we choose to go down the path of Lady Folly at that crossroads, what will be the long-term effect of those types of decisions? 
Friends, I do thoroughly believe that every one of us today is at a crossroads. In your life, in mine, what's there? Physically, relationally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, the list goes on and on. What decision can you visualize right here, right now at the crossroads? And whose voice are you listening to? We are uh, crying for the attention to have clarity in our lives. And there are multiple voices that are wanting to speak into where we need wisdom and discernment. Whose voice are you listening to more than any other at the crossroads? Is it Jesus or is it somebody else? God desires us in those moments. If we're going to seek wisdom, we need to seek Jesus to take one step closer to Jesus. And if we do take that step, what can we expect? Well, I love Proverbs 8. What we can expect is we're going to get to the kind of the later half of this whole passage, this whole chapter. But friends, to really appreciate this the rest of this chapter, we have to actually rewind. We have to go back all the way to the beginning chapter of all of Scripture to appreciate what we're about ready to read. So just to give you a bit of context. In Genesis 1, first chapter in all of the Bible, we're told that the earth is formless and void. Some translations say it's primal chaos. And we're told that God's Spirit is kind of hovering over the waters, and eventually God will create, and He'll create with the power of a word. He'll say, let there be light, and out of what seems to be chaotic, God brings order and shape. It's almost like a little boy with a green shabby coat. God takes something that seems to be nothing, and He makes something incredible out of it. And the beauty is, is that we're told, and even Proverbs 8, this picture is, is that Jesus, God's Son, this Creator, He's there in the beginning long before God ever creates something. Long before Jesus creates. Grab your Bibles here. Let's look at verse 24. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters. Before the mountains were formed, before the hills, I was born. Before he had made the earth and the fields and the first handfuls of soil, I was there when he established the heavens, when he drew the horizons of the oceans. I mean, what Solomon is talking about is what the Apostle Paul clearly talks about even in Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16. We'll throw it on the screen. Jesus existed before anything was created and is supreme over all of creation. For through him, God created what? Everything. Uh, Solomon's giving us a picture of the Genesis story that before it all got created, Jesus is there full of wisdom. And the verses that we just read there, particularly even in verse 27, the word we get is that Jesus then established the heavens and he continues to mark territories that word established and that word marked in the original language, which is Hebrew, it's a word that means carved. I love that picture that Jesus, the creator, he begins to start carving and carving and carving and he makes something out of nothing, out of disorder, order, and it's beautiful. In Proverbs 8.30, we read that Jesus is an architect. I love that image that the architect is carving out plan upon plan. And friends, guess what? We're a part of those plans. Grab your Bibles. My favorite verse in this whole passage. One I believe that all of us need to hear today. Solomon says, And how happy I was with the world he created. How I rejoiced, some translations say, delight with the human family. Do you know what God's greatest joy and delight is? You us. That the architect came, full of wisdom that we get a picture of in this scene, and God in all of his perfect wisdom began to start carving and carving and carving. And friends, we are beautifully made, carved, wonderfully made. And the beauty is, is that we are carved by Jesus in a way that is evidence that he is perfect and that God loves us bigger than we can fathom or imagine. And that's evidenced by the fact that even in our imperfections, now that we have gone down the path of lady folly and we've sinned, that God loves us so much that this creator and architect had a design and a plan that he carved out that he would come to our place in our time, this planet known as Earth. 
and he would literally lay down his life for every one of us. The perfect architect and creator would give his life for us on a cross so that we could be made right with God. We are loved long before we ever came into the story known as earth, and we are loved by the work of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. And for every one of us that want to heed his voice and put our trust in him and submit our lives to him, that big question that we're talking about, friends, this is known as the gospel, the good news that Jesus ultimately brings. And when I trust Jesus and when you trust Jesus and we put our hope in him, the gospel declares that we are known and loved and forgiven and free. We're protected. And the beauty is not only are we protected, God gives us wisdom as a means to protect us time and time again, that we don't go down the path of Lady Fowley, that we consistently continue to trust in the one who wants to time and time again, continue to carve and carve and recreate us day in and day out. Friends, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus loves us, period. And I know about you, but at times I have major identity crisis moments. That I believe that my life is the sum total of worst decisions and at times greatest achievements. And some of us need to hear this today. Friends, identity is never, 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 never received. Like I did this bad thing. Now I've received my identity. I've done this great thing. I've received my identity. Identity is never received. It's only given. It's given. Like we are given it with no strings attached. I'm not receiving it based on what I've done. We receive the heartbeat of the gospel, which declares that we are loved. We're just freely given that and we accept it. And in my worst moments, I can believe that I've created the sole identity of all that I am. And Jesus comes because he loves us fully and wants to take over our lives, submit all to him, that we might continue to invite the creator, the architect, with a simple prayer that just goes like this. Lord, recreate me today. In the crossroad moments of my life, between the path of folly and wisdom, I need you to recreate me to do what's right. Friends, I believe that as we pray that prayer over and over and over again, guess what happens? Guess what happens? We begin to start burying this image of who God has created us to be to the world around us. The grace that has recreated us is also the grace that releases us to bear God's image of creator and architect and his goodness is imprinted upon us. His faithfulness is there clear as day and the world sees that and that makes all the difference. We're called to be image bearers. Got your Bibles. Let's look here in chapter 8 verses 15 and 16. This is a powerful two verses that collides with our cultural moment that we find ourselves in, in ways that we need to listen to and follow as example. Proverbs 8, 15. Because of me, kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help and nobles make righteous judgments. The picture that Solomon is getting in the ancient Near East, the kings would make decrees. And that word there in the Hebrew is the word carve. Again, this kind of idea of carving is a key word today. So a king would carve these words on tablets because a king would see disorder in the culture. It would make laws that are filled with God's wisdom and justice and would carve those things on tablets and they would lead God's people. Now, I don't know about you, when when I think about that, that good leaders take disorder and make order, I mean, isn't that what we long for right now in our cultural moment? Did you realize that over 50 years ago, particularly in the American story, that public opinion was is that 77% of people trusted elected officials? Do you know what the percentage is now over a half a century later? 17%. I was even on social media this week. I came across a clip that randomly just was on my algorithm, my feed, and it was a person literally yelling every obscenity possible and putting up a a middle finger to a politician on a screen, assuming that that politician could hear this individual. We're living in a moment where we are cynical about leaders. You know, I, I think the thing is, it's easy to blame. It's easy to complain, throw a revolt. 
But I'm mindful of the story here that we get to be kings and queens in our cultural moment. We get to be priests in the midst of hard times, that we, in fact, are representatives of God's kingdom. We can blame, complain, revolt, or we can be image bearers in our cultural moment, reflecting of the goodness of who God is, that He is the one that has given us wisdom to walk down and follow life that is truly life. That is the path that is declared for every one of us. And here's how it works. When we bear that image well, when we take on that responsibility, friends, our family and friends around us gets curious And that curiosity leads to a moment of Holy Spirit conviction in their lives. Gosh, there's something different about the path that you're living versus what I'm living. And that conviction eventually leads to a certainty that they must trust in Jesus. And then they give their life away and Jesus starts carving and carving and carving in their lives. And they're willing to bear that image and reflect that to others. And guess what happens? It comes full circle. The people that got changed through you they end up changing others because others around them are curious about who Jesus is. This is the path of disciple-making. This is the path of what it means to follow wisdom. You know, last Sunday at church, my youngest, Clayton, came running up to me. And Clayton doesn't walk. He runs all the time. And he's got this in his hand. And the lesson down in in children's ministry last week was about Hannah and this prayer box. And he's like, look at this prayer box that I made. And on the way home, it was just he and I in the car. And so we had a whole conversation about prayer. Like, why should we pray? And I was blown away by the wisdom of a seven-year-old boy. who He just simply said, well, we should pray because God loves us. At one point, he said, God made us. And then he eventually said, God already knows what we're going to ask him. I was floored by the wisdom that he had. And so last Sunday night, before we went to bed, I grabbed a piece of paper. I said, let's write write a prayer. My little guy wrote a prayer, and he put it in the box. There's some in here right now. And when we were done, he looked at me and said, you going to write one? I said, yeah, man, I'm going to write one too. Clayton was leading me. He was, had moments, of, it was an image-bearing moment where I was convinced and reminded time and time again, it doesn't matter if you're 7 or 77 or 107. Prayer matters. At the crossroads, crossroads of our lives, between wisdom and folly, it all matters. Clayton, like me, it may look different, has green, shabby coat moments where we look at our lives and say, God, can you create something out of seamlessly what seems like it's not worth anything anymore? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. Friends, in this moment today, I think we come back to that initial first question. What if? What could the God of the universe do if we submitted our entire lives to him? A ton. He would give us the life. And so if that's the case in whatever crossroads that you find yourself today, friends, God loves you. He made you. He already knows the things that are on your heart, would you in faith give them to him? At the crossroads, would we fill up the prayer box? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that in this moment, the crossroads that we find in our own lives, this tension and temptation between folly and wisdom, will we heed your voice and recognize that you are good and faithful and you are always willing to carve. You are to be that architect and creator and we submit and we trust you in this moment. Work Holy Spirit and change us. Change us so much that we bear your image to those around us that they may trust in you as well. Thank you for calling us to the life that is truly life. In your name we pray, amen. Friends, thanks for hanging out with us. This is our time of response. Uh, We'd ask that you would give adequate space today in the crossroads that you find yourself in. Would you submit it all to him? I know that's intimidating, seems extremely scary. I get it. I'm there with you. Friends, we do believe that everything that you are wrestling with, it matters. God desires to take it and do something incredible with it. Trust him today. Thank you.
We now come to the time of our service for the offering. As always, the offering is for those that call this place their home. If you're a guest with us this morning, if you're just tuning in and happen to have watched up to this point, uh, we're grateful that you've done so, but we ask that you would not give. Uh, But if this is your home, if this is your primary place of worship, this is our opportunity to give in response to a God who has given us everything. As we say often, the greatest offering that we can give is the offering of our lives and service to God. So we want to take a moment to recognize some members, some new members who have uh, taken some time to offer their lives and service to Him through our church. So some names will come up on the screen. We want to recognize them. We want to celebrate with them. Uh, Hey, many of them started online, started watching us online and tuning in maybe during the pandemic and right after the pandemic uh, and have come and join us in person and have now become members of our church. So we want to celebrate with them and I want to encourage you to reach out to them and encourage them as well. Uh, But during this time, let's pray for the offering. uh, Ask God to bless it. Uh, Father, we recognize that every good gift comes from above. God, and that every blessing that we have comes from you. And so, Lord, when we survey our life, when we survey all that we have and all that we are, God, we do so with grateful hearts. And God, whether we feel like it is a lot or whether we feel like it is a little, Lord, we turn it back over to you. Say, Lord, may you bless it, may you multiply it, and may you use it for your kingdom and for your glory alone. So, Father, whatever we have this morning, we give to you to take you at your word Lord, that you can do wonderful and great things, greater things than we could ever fathom or imagine. Father, we love you. God, we give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you tune off this morning, before you click out of this video, uh, just a few announcements I want to make sure that you're aware about. You can find more information on our socials. I want to encourage you to make sure that you are signed up for our email newsletter that goes out weekly. Uh, That way you can stay up to date with all of our men's ministry and women's ministry events. Those are coming up. Some really cool and exciting new things uh, that we are doing, some new events and new styles. And so I want to make sure that if you are a woman that you're, uh, if you're a woman that you're connected to our women's ministry, if you're a man connected to our men's ministry. uh, So sign up for our email newsletter, follow us on socials, Uh, and then that way you can stay connected to those. But other than that, have a great week. See you later.